So, for the record, your full name. Margaret Ann Goldsmith. And I was born October 6, 1941. That's a couple of years ago. It was, 81 years ago. All right, so the reason we're here is, from my perspective, you've, you've documented an unbelievable amount of family history. We've covered that. We have documents, interviews galore. So my purpose, or what I want to put my grubby little thumbprint on, mm -hmm. is to get your thoughts on four key questions, and we can divide it up and do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the most, so I guess the most important one is the first question. What do you want history to remember your family for, in terms of the whole Goldsmith, Schiffman, Bernstein, the whole, the, the family, what, what do you want historians in the future uh, to remember your family for in terms of, and I'm looking at economic and socio societal impacts. Those are two big, broad things. So let's, if you want to break it down, we can break it down first of all in terms of the economic impact your family has. Um, the way that I, I can think about it easily is to take them by generations and answer both of your questions, the economic and the societal, with each generation. Uh, and much of what I'm saying has, is, is at the archives, but I've uh, consolidated it somewhat right. so you see and, them as each as individuals. Right, and again, I'm looking for what you want yes. people to focus in on. Right, uh, so the first generation, and I, it was the immigrant generation, and they came, I think most of those came around 1848. There was a big immigration from Germany, and they came to uh, their ports of entry, which were Baltimore a lot and Cincinnati. And uh, they worked their way down eventually. They came as individually. Some of the men came individually. I think Morris Bernstein did. And the others came with families that I have researched and found that there were brothers or brothers and sisters. So these young people came, this is how they came from Germany at that point in time. And they worked their way to Huntsville. The Bernsteins and the Hursteins and the Schiffmans came to Huntsville, uh, the Bernsteins and Hursteins before the Civil War. The Schiffmans, uh, one uh, participated in the was a Confederate soldier, Daniel Schiffman. But eventually they got to Huntsville. And why did they come? Uh, I think you have to look at that. Why would they leave the culture and the families that they left in Germany and come to this strange land? But America was the promised land. And it gave them a chance to do things that they had not been able to do in the old world. It gave them a chance to own property. That was very big for them. And to eventually move into other professions that they had not been able to do in Germany. They were only allowed to work in commerce and money lending, which money lending was not allowed Christians. And so they fell into the economic slot that provided a living. So they came to America and they settled, the ones that settled in Huntsville, either they had probably before been, uh, been traveling salesmen or such, but by the time they got here, they, they, had a, they were well, well off enough that they could 
rent buildings and some went into business with partners. So what they provided for Huntsville was they fill the slot between the planners, the wealthy planners, and the farmers, and probably backwoodsmen, to provide the, the commerce, the goods that they needed. And they opened, they opened the stores around the square, which weren't very many. But that was the important uh, slot that they filled. And they, their descendants continued filling this slot uh, for several generations, after which the, the children were educated and many moved away and the promised land broke up the community as these younger folks went to the north or larger Jewish communities. So the, this, uh, one, one thing I, I remember reading is that Robert Hurstein had uh, owned a business with a Mr. Smith. And I read in one of the uh, history books around Huntsville that he had cut all the material for many, many of the Confederate soldiers. So that was, you know, that was, that would, you can see from that what he was, what the Jewish community was providing. Uh, also interesting, this first generation, the women worked. Morris Bernstein's wife had a notion shop and they eventually bought a building on the south side of the square and lived above it and each had their own business. Morris had a watch repair shop and clocks were very important at that time. Everybody had a mantle clock and everybody had a pocket watch. And so it, as a watchmaker, he fulfilled an important role in, in the community. Of all the immigrant generation, Morris Bernstein acquired the most real estate, and I feel like it's worth talking about. He either bought land or he bought houses. I'm not sure which ones he built and uh, which ones were already built when he bought them. But he bought them, bought houses on East and West Clinton and East and West Homes mainly. And the most important thing he did was he bought property where the avenue is located today. And that's at the corner of Jefferson and Holmes. And he constructed uh, a strip of, pro of buildings for the African American community. So I've thought about this because there was, after slavery, there was no place for the African Americans to, to have businesses because they couldn't make the leap to owning property. And did he recognize this? Uh, because he had experienced not having property and being poor in Germany and wanting to help them with the transition from slavery to property ownership. I'm not, I have no idea, but I do know that he developed that block. And I had pictures of the buildings there that were rented. And one that is still in business is the Royal Funeral Home. And all of those papers are at UAH. But he built those buildings. Now anyone could have been the investor to do that, but he was. It made good economic sense, of course, but was it also, it, it was stepping out in a new direction, and he was the one that did it. And I think that's uh, an important statement to make about Morris. As far as, so in addition to that, they did become involved, this early generation became involved civically or in the larger community. And Morris and Morris Bernstein and Robert Hurstein, who were my great-great-grandfathers, were actually on the board of the, the early bank, which I thought was quite impressive. And uh, Solomon Schiffman was on the city council. And Robert Hurstein, after the Civil War, was treasurer of city government. 
So they, they provided for, for the city as far as religious, they're, they're following their Judaism. They, this first generation in 1874, after the war, other Jews had come and they uh, went to the city and requested a Hebrew burial ground. And that was the first evidence of an organized Jewish community in Maple Hill. And the next thing, the following year, they organized B'nai B'rith, which was a fraternal organization. And its duties were similar to all the other fraternal organizations. It was to help take care of each other. And then the next year, they formed congregation B'nai Shalom. And B'nai Shalom, I, I, the members of B'nai Shalom, were the same as the members of B'nai B'rith. And I think they realized that they needed two separate organizations. And so that's how the same group of people had two different organizations. And they rented together, they shared a room at the Masonic Lodge. And that went on for 25 years before they were able to, the next generation, build Temple B'nai Shalom. Uh, the immigrant generation and the next two generations were very active in the Shriners. They were Masons. Some third, my grandfather was a 32 degree Mason. And so the question is why? It was the, the Shriners were very open to all religions. They were uh, very egalitarian and Although these early immigrants in the first two generations really, or at least the first generation, as I said before, were not part of the social circle. They were active in, in civically and in, in business and philanthropically, but they weren't part of the social group. And as I said, they had the standard club. However, the, the Shriners were open uh, to all people. And so they gravitated there. And it was a place to network with the business community in a more s social setting. And so that's why I think many of them, uh, Solomon Schiffman, my grandfather, I had their, mas I had their certificates. And they were part of the legacy. Uh, that I'll talk about later. Uh, and so it was perfectly, uh, it, w it, it made good sense for them to rent a room for B'nai B'rith and the synagogue, the temple, the congregation rather, congregation B'nai Shalom, for them to be there. So I think that, it, oh, they also, although they, had been involved with the the civics, the you know the the government and the bank, and they provided the economic needs of of the town. They t weren't part of the social groups, and so they formed a group called the Standard Club. And they I don't know where they met, but there are articles in the paper about the Standard Club that they had balls and raised funds to help take care of the furnishings of their room, and they were quite active. So the Standard Club was just a Jewish organization? A Jewish organization. And they were urged to marry within the faith, and so what they did, they had parties. And they would invite young men from, or women, from outside, uh, away from Huntsville, from neighboring communities, from Montgomery, from even as far away as, as I think, Cincinnati. Atlanta. And, and they would have a ball. It was to introduce the couples to each other in hope that uh, courting would follow and eventual marriages. So that's how they... Interesting. Did you not know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was... So does that is, do you have any other questions about that immigrant? Do you have a picture? Yeah, I do. 
Very okay. Good. The next generation, their children. Uh, Morris Bernstein had three daughters, and the middle daughter, Betty, married uh, a young man who was traveling from New York, Oscar Goldsmith. And Oscar's parents had settled in New York actually in the 1830s. And I do know there were several children, but Oscar traveled south for a jewelry concern and met Betty. And I'm sure Morris and Oscar probably met at B'nai B'rith. And Morris would brought Oscar home to meet his daughters and so on. Betty and Oscar, Oscar married. And um, Oscar initially went into business with one of Betty's mother's relatives, uh, a Newman. And I know that he, the, mo the majority of his life, he was assistant treasurer of Dallas Mill. And so his, they, you know, there, there had been a branching out from the initial dry goods store into the larger economic community. Now how that happened, uh, this is according to our family lore. I haven't been able to find it documented, but that growing up in New York that he knew O'Shaughnessy and he helped convince him, uh, the group that came here to start Dallas Mill. And that's how Oscar became assistant treasurer most of his life. But O'Shaughnessy was not Jewish. Correct, but he, he was, was an Irishman. Irish. So they may have lived in the same, it, close to each other in the same community. Right. But that, I haven't been able to document it. But then thinking, why was he assistant treasurer? Because the treasurer, I think, was more of a figurehead. Mm -hmm. And Oscar did the main work. He was the mover and shaker. So Oscar was your great-grandfather. My great-grandfather. So economically, that's what he did. Now, this next generation, this, is this the first generation, the kids that were bought, born here, not the immigrant. They're called the first generation. Mm -hmm. Betty, uh, this first generation, the women did not work. They had gotten to the point that they could be with their families and uh, involved with the larger community. And Betty was very vivacious and very much ahead of her time. She started a group called the United Charities. And the first meeting of the group that I read about was at the Jewish synagogue, which would have been at the Masonic Lodge. Right. Yeah, the old Masonic, mm -hmm. where is it in the same place that the new one, that the present one is. So the Masonic Lodge was at one time a temple? No, the, the B'nai B'rith and congregation rented a room at the Masonic Lodge. Got it. You got it. And uh, so that was, it, it, it wasn't strange that they would meet there and that the group was to help the sick and needy. And I think that somewhat evolved from Betty's, Betty being familiar with the problems that the mills had with poverty and so on. All oh, right. And uh, young women, there was, the Dallas Mill was did more things for their community than any other mill. They, they had, um, they had a dorm for the young women who came to work there and weren't married, for instance. And some of my classmates have mentioned to me that their grandfathers or father worked at the mills and how Dallas was exceptional in what it did for, its, for the people that worked there, more so than other mills mm -hmm. and the facilities. And I, it, I think that Betty had a hand in that and encouraging Oscar as treasurer to provide more for the work, the workmen. Uh, Betty's involvement with the United Charities evolved into uh, the first hospital. What happened was she was appointed by the other women to go to the city council or the city fathers at that time. 
and ask for funds for a hospital. And they refused her. And Betty went back to the group and she gathered the women and some of the husbands and they, and they went back to the city fathers and this time the first they, they provided the money for the first hospital and it was called the infirmary and Betty was on the board of directors and was secretary for the group for the rest of her life. The Huntsville Infirmary eventually evolved into Huntsville Hospital. It was first a little cottage, then it, uh, Molly Teal, the local madam, left her house to the hospital and they, they, were, they were there and then eventually they built Huntsville Hospital. Which is now the second largest employer in the county. In the county, yes, yes. So that was Betty. Uh, the other, my other great grandfather was Isaac Schiffman. And Isaac came to Huntsville to work from Germany. He immigrated around 1875 to work for his uncle, Solomon Schiffman, who had a store on the north side of the square. And Solomon and his wife, Bertha, had no children. And so they, they brought Isaac's nephew, Isaac, they brought Solomon's nephew, Isaac, over, who was quite bright. To help, I, to help Solomon in the store. And uh, so Isaac, when Solomon died in, 18, in the 1898 or so, he took over the business and he expanded it tremendously. He began to buy property, he kept up the dry goods store, but he bought property. He went into the Surrey business where Constitution Hall Village is today. And, um, and he also, uh, the, the, his, he bought the building that we're in now, the I. Schiffman building, because the dry goods store had evolved into the banking business. This was to lend money to the farmers who were buying products and so on, because the banks didn't were limited in, at that time. And so many of the stores would lend money and evolved into a, a loan business. So when he bought this building from the Southern Saving and Loan, it suited his needs of continuing his banking business and having an administrative business building for his other business. You know, this is this building. That's this building. So that, he, he, he uh, accumulated a good bit of wealth. He was very capable. And he brought his, my grandfather, who married his daughter Annie in 1908, he brought him into the business and he also brought his son Robert into the business. And it was a partnership and eventually, years later, it was incorporated into I. Schiffman and Company. But Isaac also, I want to address what they did in the community. They weren't on the bank, they weren't on the board, and they didn't hold any offices. Uh, but they were very charitable. Isaac, besides the, the, the hospital uh, involvement that Oscar was on and Betty was, both of them were on the board, Isaac, um, remembered his hometown of Hopstetten, Germany. And they, the t he visited often to visit his relatives back there. And he was invited to ask to send money for a water system. And he established a, a water system for the little town of Hopstetten. Which is located where now? In the it's south of Frankfurt on the okay. river Nehi Nehi near the Rhine. He established that and then as Jewish, this was uh, close to the time he died around, 19, he died in 1910, but around 1908 or 9, he was, uh, he was asked by the Jewish community in Hopstetten to provide funds for a Jewish school because at that point, Jews were not allowed 
to go to school with the Christian children. Oh, and, in, in the early 1900s? In the early 1900s. So that didn't connect with the Holocaust exactly, but for a time, from time to time as boundaries shifted and there was prejudice from different societies, that was what happened in, in Hopstead. So he provided money, and I, many years later, I visited with my daughter, and I saw the really? the building that he had built that had, since all the Jews were dead, killed, that um, that building was an apartment building. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, as an aside, I met, uh, I met many people in the town when I visited, because it was only 2,000. It was about 20 years ago. And I, I met a fellow who was writing about the Jewish community. And he, had, he lived next to the old uh, Jewish school. And he had had a pen and ink drawing made of it. And he gave me a copy. Wow. And it's in the collection. And he was German. And he was German. He, when he had come to, to Hopstedden, the last Jewish member of the community died. The only reason she was still living is she had been married to a non-Jew and somehow the community was able to save her from the Nazis wow. and she just died. And he said he was so amazed because he said it was the mourning for this lady was, was so, it, it was just so much. It was as if they had, in her, they felt they lost the whole community. So there was a great deal of mourning. And that what, that's what precipitated his interest in doing research about the Jewish community. Wow. But that's sort of an aside. But, but, it, but it's still part of that. It's still part of great grandfather's his, his, yeah. He died of, he died of complications of diabetes, which we found in the family, my father had diabetes. Um, so each generation carried on the family tradition of um, business and passing the family assets on to the next generation. Uh, they supported their religious community. Isaac was chairperson of the building committee for Temple B'nai Shalom and Oscar was on the committee. And Betty donated the Holy Ark where we keep the Torah. And many of the windows were donated by the, the descendants or the other, the widow, the widow ladies of the community. And I, knowing Betty's interest in the hospital, I feel like she was probably the one that encouraged that and by her own donations. Um, this first generation, Isaac had died, and Oscar, along with my grandfather and my grandmother and her brother and sister-in-law, donated land for the Goldsmith Schiffman Field. So this is the first evidence of the family of that my ancestors getting involved with philanthropy. You know, another a move, another move. And the Goldsmith Schiffman Field was just the, the, it was why they did it. I have a feeling that it was my grandfather's idea because he had start, helped start the Boy Scouts. So he was interested in sports. And that might have been why he came up with the idea of a football field, or maybe the city suggested that it was important uh, because we didn't. We were playing football then at the various mills and different fields. So he, they donated the field for the school children in memory of Betty Goldsmith and Betty Schiffman, who had recently died. So if you read the plaque, you see that and you think it, it is unusual for a football field to be named after two ladies, but it just happened to be the interest of the family. 
So, in, in, so the family paid for that to be built? No, they own. I'm sorry, they owned, they owned the land. The land. Yeah, because uh, they had Oscar had also acquired land. Os Oscar and some of the other family members after Dallas Mill came, they acquired land around Dallas Mill and built Dallas Village, which is now a historical right. area. So they built, the, they built the village, and they had two acres in, in the area that they owned, and they donated those, those uh, not did I say two acres, two blocks for the ball field. So there were not any houses there at the time? There were two old houses that were taken down, and then the city closed the street, and the CCC was active at that at that time. It was in the mid '30s, and they built the wall. Wow! And the Acme Club raised funds for the lighting. Wow. The next generation, uh, my grandfather Lawrence Goldsmith Sr. married Annie Schiffman. So Lawrence was the son of Betty and Oscar Goldsmith, mm -hmm. and Annie was the daughter of Isaac Schiffman and Betty Hurstein. Mm -hmm. So that's how the families came together. The, right. the early generations came together right. in my family. And they married in 1908. And my grandfather had been in business with his brother-in-law at a men's store, Goldsmith Grocer. His name was Grocer. And then he came into, came into I. Schiffman partnership with his father, father-in-law, Isaac. And that was in 1909 when he married my grandmother. And in 1910, Isaac died, as I said, of diabetes. And then his son Robert became president and my grandfather became secretary treasurer. And pretty much he ran, he was, quite capable and I think he ran the business which had then evolved. It was the Surrey business and Robert trans transitioned that to the automobile business, the first Dodge business in Huntsville. I don't know what other automobile businesses were around and it was located on the block where Constitution Hall Village is today. Really? So there, the Huntsville was really small and to have a... It was one square mile. Yeah, well, whatever it was at that point in time when cars came in in the early 1900s. So he, it was the automobile business, the banking business that had been established, continued. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't think they, they, they rented this dry goods store to somebody else. And they began to, uh, the banking business with the loans acquired, uh, they bought and sold farms and they acquired farmland because it's during the depression there, there were for foreclosures. And I think it was quite ethical. I remember my grandfather talking about this one fellow who kept buying property and he said, you've got to quit doing it because you won't be able to pay the note. And he's, he really, it, he, it disturbed him greatly that, that he had to take it over. Yeah. So. So the, is that how uh, Warrens got a lot of the land that is on Red, what is now Redstone? Um, I'm not sure about Redstone. I know this was the Big Cove property okay. that I'm talking okay. about that he especially, but there was a lot of buying. They would buy prop farms, sell farms, and by the time I was born, there was mainly the Big Cove farm. Uh, then, so you mentioned the arsenal. My grandfather, let's see, my grandfather was he was on a number of boards. I know he was on Brown Engineering Board, so there was still this tradition of being involved in the, the larger community. 
And of course, there was a Goldsmith Schiffman feel that was his idea. The other thing that he did was he realized that Huntsville needed a grand hotel. And he had uh, gone to school, he had gone to a boarding school in New York, so he was familiar with New York, and he, he'd gone to business school in Cincinnati. And he knew that he could see Huntsville needed a hotel similar, but of course smaller, than what he saw in New York. And the family owned the property where the Russell Erskine is. And he gathered friends and other family members, Robert Schiffman and Oscar, and Oscar Goldsmith, and a number of other people in the community. And they raised funds and sold stock. And they were able to build the Russell Erskine Hotel. And my grandfather, Lawrence Goldsmith, was took a great deal of interest in the hotel. In fact, he and my grandmother moved there after it was built into an apartment, and he remained there the rest of his life in an apartment in the hotel. And he, um, he just ex very involved. He was always secretary treasurer because that's where he could make the most decisions and mm -hmm. the control. He was not president. He never wanted to be president. And the Russell Erskine, to go on, I, I think it played a great part in, in Huntsville. As Jimmy Taylor, uh, a manager for many years, said, everything went on at the Russell Erskine. Proms, all kinds of club meetings. It was where later uh, the generals and were stayed when they came that were involved with the arsenal. Jimmy said, everything happened at the Russell Erskine except for funerals. Yeah. So in addition to that, the, the most important thing that my grandfather did, uh, it, you'll have to listen to my story. So he, we owned a, prop, a farm called Green Grove, and it was down near the river where the, ar where the arsenal and, and other properties were. There were a number of families black and white, that many of them owned their own land. Right. And my grandfather got a call one day from uh, Mr. Manny. George Manny. George Manny. And George asked him, said, we've got, <laughs> we had a call from Washington, and we, there's some people coming down on the train, and would you go with me to meet them because they want to look at land where you have a farm <coughs> down near Green Grove? And my grandfather agreed. So they met the, the fellows from, the, from Washington. The Chemical Corps. Actually. The Chemical Corps. And so they drove, they drove them around all day. And after the men left the next day, my grandfather, who knew John Sparkman, got in contact with him. He wrote, I think, he, I don't know if he wrote, or sent a telegram or called him, but he contacted John because John had been a good friend. He, had, he was in Huntsville, and my grandfather had become friends with John and had always been supportive of him in his campaigns and so on. So he could, he probably need to mention that John Sparkman was the junior congressman. He was a junior congressman at that time. So he contacted John and, said, and told him what had happened, that these fellows had come. He said they knew exactly what they wanted, where they wanted to go. They had maps, but they were very secretive. And would you find out what was going on? That call was extremely important. Had it not been followed up, we wouldn't have the arsenal. So what happened was John found out and contacted my grandfather back and said, they are looking for a site for a munitions center. And they're considering about four or five sites, and Huntsville is one of them. So is Memphis? Memphis. Little Rock, Arkansas? Little Rock, Arkansas. They look at Florence, Alabama? Florence. And Huntsville was not the favored site at all. And John said, 
these, these were letters, and all these letters are in the files at UAH and in the Sparkman Library. And John said, I'll talk to other folks. What's his? Oh, uh, Lister Hill. Lister Hill. I'll talk to Lister. Because he was a senator. Because he was a senator, Lister Hill. So he talked to him, and he came back, and he, and he explained to my grandfather what was going on. And so my grandfather and John then communicated regularly yeah. a number of letters. And John worked, worked it in Washington with Lister Hill to get the, the arsenal for Huntsville. And my grandfather, what he did was he entertained them. They came back. He put them up at the Russell Erskine. He wined and dined them. And so between the, the three of them, the decision was Huntsville. In less than a, a couple of weeks, they made that decision. And my theory is the other player in this, beside my grandfather, was the Russell Erskine Hotel. Because they knew that it was a, a lovely place to stay. They would be wined and dined. From then on, there would be other generals coming. And it would feel like home. And I think that, how they were treated here, really aided the, the, the decision oh, yeah. but Lawrence, to come here. Yeah, Lawrence convinced them also that even though Huntsville only had you know, 17,000 people, mm -hmm. And they needed up to 20,000 to work there. He convinced them that, oh yeah, we'll bring in people from the local community. We'll, he convinced them that the city and the business community, which he was a leader of, mm -hmm. convinced them that, no, this is the place to be. And it was that hospitality, everything he did. But, right. but I mean, had it not been... Had it not been for him, we, would be here. Would we be here. wouldn't have, we would not have... You know, you can't point to anything, but you can see all the factors in his salesmanship. Yeah. You didn't tell Lawrence Goldsmith no. He convinced you. What, he convinced you because he believed in whatever he wanted to happen. It wasn't a manipulation. It was, it was more he strongly believed in whatever he believed in. And he thought the arsenal, it was important for Huntsville. And so it was, because otherwise we would still be, what, an Arab? Or, or a Florence. Or a Florence. Except it does nothing. We, we would have had nothing. Yeah, I mean. The, had that not happened. It, there would be no space program here. There's not right. insulation in right. World War II. You know. So then after the, after the war, after the war, that land, the arsenal closed, and that land was available for sale. And it was when Von Braun came here that the decision was made this was a perfect site for the missile center and all the German scientists. So had the land not been acquired for, this, for the arsenal, had it not been there, we would not have had been able to locate the German scientists here and the defense and everything that's followed. And now, what, 95% of Huntsvillians would probably not be here because they, in some way, are related right. to what's going on. Margaret Ann, do you think, going back to early 1941, when Lawrence Goldsmith uh, entered, met the first group of Army officials and then the, the generals who finally made the decision, mm -hmm. If you think of everything the family has done in terms of an impact, do you think that ranks as number one? The number it's, one impact? Oh, yes, yeah. I think that of everything. And the, each, each generation provided what was needed. A building block. A building block for the growth of Huntsville. Right. But this was the most important building block. And he was the right person at the right time. 
now, for uh, this to happen. Now, getting back more on going back to your reflections, your thoughts. Mm -hmm. When I got here 40 years ago, mm -hmm. all right, and Lauren, he died in 80 what? In 72. 72. And so when I got here, everybody still knew who he was and his importance. Mm -hmm. It's now 40 plus, 45 years later. But no, your grandfather died in what year? 70 72. Years. So 50 years uh, later now. Yeah. Um, do you think people have forgotten about him, about what he did? I do. I, I think that as far as the, the Space Museum, everything, people in Huntsville think that Huntsville began with Von Braun and the German team. And because every, all the exhibits show that. And it's not to say that I would want my grandfather to be promoted as with, in that way. But it is important to always know what happened before yeah. and, and to realize that nothing happens in a vacuum. In fact, the, the V-2s, you have to look at the history of the V-2 rocket also because it was developed in Nordhausen Dora, which was concentration camp. And at that time, slave labor from the camps were used to build those rockets. And that, that also has not been looked at. It provides a broader perspective of where we are today. And not only are, you know, some things are unpleasant to look at and examine, it is important to look at the good and the bad. And understand how Huntsville got to where it is. There were some, some, the V-2 rocket does not have the most pleasant history. Um, right. So I want to go back to uh, late 1949. Uh, John Sparkman is a senator. Mm -hmm. Bob Jones now takes the seat that John Sparkman had. Um, and so there was lobbying on the part of Bob Jones, John Sparkman, John Sparkman now being a, an important senator, mm -hmm. to convince the Army to move that rocket team from Fort Bliss to Huntsville. Um, what, and, and, and your grandfather was still, obviously, 1949, still very active in the business community. Mm -hmm. What? What, what influences did he have on that? On bringing them here? Yeah. I mean, he was talk, still talking to John Sparkman. He Sparkle was, but I'm not, I'm not, sh I don't know. <clears throat> because I was, you know, I was eight years old at that time. Yeah. And I, I didn't hear the discussion. And my grandfather didn't talk a, a lot about what was going on in his life outside of just business. the business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> also at that time, um, he, was, he was aware of, had been aware of what was going on in Germany because one of the important things that he did outside of what I've mentioned so far was that my grandmother had first cousins in Germany who were trying desperately to get out. And they began to write my grandmother because that was the only connection they had outside of Germany. And he and my grandmother began see, receiving letters from Isaac's, Isaac Schiffman's sister's children. And these letters are just heartbreaking as you read them. And he attempted to get all of them out. He was only able to get one family out. Uh, they had a visa, they had a, it, it was 
the visas were in order, you know, how early you applied and so on. But they had applied for an early visa and he was able to get them out. One, one of the children, uh, one of the boys was able to escape to eventually get to Israel. And all the others died in, con in concentration camps, extermination camps. And they were all from the Hopstetten area towns nearby. And all those papers I gave to the Holocaust Museum in Washington when I found them. And uh, copies are all at UAH. Now you did not know about this until you discovered the papers Correct. in 2008? I, no, I found those papers. After my grandfather died, I began going through the vault where we had tons of papers, and I found those papers. And reading them was in the 70s, was such a shock because schools had not really taught about the Holocaust. And my grandfather didn't talk about this. All, he, all I knew was he was so pleased that he was able to bring the Ludwig Marxes over. And when he would go to New York, they would come to town, they would come to the city, and they would visit. He never mentioned the ones that were lost. So he, he also, at that point in time, he was approached by the United Jewish Appeal. And the United Jewish Appeal was an, a national organization that raised funds to help with during the war. Uh, to help with the refugees. And he began, this was in, 1930, in the 1937, and he began to raise funds in Huntsville, not just from the, he organized the Jewish community, and they raised funds among themselves and within the larger community. He tapped all of his good friends, and I think he, would, he, he raised funds each year and it, it was quite a lot if you calculated by today's dollars. And I had all those papers from the United Jewish Appeal, and I gave them to the Holocaust Museum and to UAH because they're secondary material. They show what he knew going on that was going on internationally at that point in time. So he, the, it's, it's an odd position that he's in. You know, here the German science is coming to town, and then his familiarity with what was going on through the UJA and his experience with my grandmother's cousins. But he didn't talk about any of that. And if, if I could just have him here today, that's the subject that I would like to talk about, is how he dealt with that how he dealt with that conflict, and still be uh, involved with the larger community, urging them to come here, but... At the same time, knowing the, that they were complicit in the larger... Yes, yeah, that, and that's... What, what, tell me the story for the record. You told me the story back when I met you 18 years ago uh -huh. about dating the German. Oh. <laughs> how, how did that work? Okay, so I, I went to school, the, the German scientists, their children were all my age, a year, year older or younger. And when I, they, they mainly went to East Clinton because many of them lived on Montesano. And they went to East Clinton and then they went to junior high and high school, Huntsville High School. So I went to West Clinton and I didn't meet them until I went to Huntsville High, and I was in the 10th grade. Because high school, junior high, I went through the 9th grade then, and Huntsville High began in the 10th. And I met this young man, and his name was Hans. And Hans uh, asked me on a date. He wanted to drive me around, take me home or something. And I had just started dating. And I asked, my I asked my father, since I had just started, and, I, and he said, no, 
And I said, why? And all he told me was, once a German, always a German. And I did not ask him anything else. I didn't understand what he meant because nobody explained what, ha what had happened. Oh. And, you know, the children, I'm sure, knew very little because they'd come, come over when they were younger. Right. And did the parents talk about what had happened in Germany? And many, many years later, uh, Monica Laney interviewed the children and some of the Jewish community, some of the, father, the town fathers at that point in time. This wasn't that many years ago. And also the African-American community to get everybody's perspective mm -hmm. of that. It's, it's a book worth reading. It's oral histories from each group. And all I could, I, I was interviewed and that was really all I could remember was that one incident because it, was, it wasn't discussed. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, and before I leave my grandfather, this was the first, he was among the first generation that really became involved socially. Although his mother Betty had been involved with the ladies, uh, the standard club that I mentioned earlier was still in existence. But my grandfather, because of his personality and his, the respect he had in the larger community, he, he was quite social. Uh, with, he fished, he hunted, he loved to play poker, and he started, he was among the group that started Bird Springs Rod and Gun Club and was an avid hunter all of his life, till his last year at 89 years old. And um, he also started a camp on the Paint Rock River called um, Holly Tree. It was near Holly Tree, Alabama. And it started with fishing and then camping and staying overnight. And then he got the locals uh, to rent some land, and so they started a camp. And the way they funded it was just absolutely brilliant, so that it was shared, the cost was shared among everybody, the winners and losers. And he would take, the, he would take money out of the kitty. And he kept all the records of the winnings and losings. And, and in fact, I gave all the Holly Tree records to the UAH has them now. And uh, a fellow, uh, Paul Hayes, used those materials and wrote a book, Holly Tree, A Gentleman's Camp. And he asked me, I, he, I got to know him because he was using the family papers, and he said, I see all the winnings and losings, but he said there's one person, because everybody was put down by their initials, he said there's one call, there's one gentleman whose name is Cat, K-A-T, and Cat always wins. And he, he wanted to know more about Cat. And I said, Cat is the kitty. And the, it's the kitty's money that they take out to run the camp. And it was, it was uh, quite a social event. They had parties. They had weekend parties or week parties at July 4th and Labor Day. And my grandfather would invite all the folks from the arsenal and all the, the generals and so on. And he just assumed they'd want to come, and many of them did come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw it. You showed me that. Yeah, right. Okay. All right, so I, I didn't mention that he was treasurer. He, he, he also was, had an office, and he was an officer at the temple, and he was treasurer as was his father, Oscar Goldsmith. Now, is this the time when there was still only one temple here? Yes. In town? Right. Before? Before. We, we didn't have uh, the conservative congregation until the 1960s. And then more recently, we have Chabad, which is Orthodox. But he was treasurer of the temple. Now, the Jewish community, 
to just center on the Jewish community. It grew, they were able to build the temple, but around the teens, it began to, the congregation began to diminish. And the reason, although Huntsville was growing, at that time, um, the mills had come to town and they were the important economic base. And so other than Oscar, who was treasurer, m most of the people involved with the mill, of course, were the folks that came from the nearby farms. And then the officers who may have been, the board may have been out of town and such. So there was, and the old dry goods stores were beginning to from the German Jews were beginning to phase out. And so a lot of the young men left, uh, or young, and young women. I had a picture of a party for, uh, uh, his name was Hen Lowenthal. And in that picture, it was a whole table of young men in their early 20s. My grandfather had that picture but it showed me how big the community was right at that point in time. And all those, most of those men moved away to the Northeast where there was more economic opportunity. So that the temple had shrunk and it had, the congregation was so small, they weren't able to have a full-time rabbi after the, around 1913. And it was barely, they were able to stay open, but barely. And it was because of his wise decisions and how money was spent that they were able to remain open. It was, it, it, at one point, there were only 13 members of the congregation, but they did manage to stay open. And it was after the war and after the arsenal that we had an influx of of, of uh, people of the Jewish faith, and they joined the temple. And then we were able to grow. And in the 1960s, we had a full-time rabbi and have had a full-time rabbi since then. So he was, you know, he not, he, his, his activities were multi, he had multi, you know, involved business, how he did it all, I don't know. In fact, he is, he is my mentor of, of all the family members, how he was able to juggle everything and compartmentalize. All right, the, the social aspect, the civic, the personal, the, the I mean. The social, the involvement with bringing people over, the UJA, he has, uh, in the collection that I gave the, the university, he has the most boxes wow. of his activities. Yeah. And if, you know, I, if there's anyone in the family that to dwell on in research, it would be my, it would be my grandfather, I think. Yeah. So then moving on to the next generation, my grandmother and grandfather had one child, my father. And he came into business with my grandfather, and his interest was the farm, and what he in he managed the farming aspect of the of I Schiffman and Company, and what he did was the more important thing that he did was he diversified the crops, and he began not just cotton but corn and mainly soybeans, and began to rotate them. And he also went into the polled Hereford business, the cattle business, on some of the land that was more suitable for pasture. And the polled Hereford, he liked because it was, uh, it's a Hereford cat, Hereford's, the brown and white, with pole means no horns. And he, he liked them and, and he, had, um, he had a registered, some registered, and built a beautiful barn. And this was all out in the Big Cove, now Hampton Cove area is where he did that. And he took the pasture land around it where the, um, 
the, the mountains, many of the pastures were surrounded by mountains, and he developed the earliest subdivisions in Huntsville on the perimeters of the mountains. Those, those are still nice houses on acre lots yeah. around the mountains. My father was a, an avid sports person and he loved baseball and he often said he wished he could be a big league baseball player. He watched the Yankees all the time and later he was a big Alabama fan and what he did, uh, he played golf. He was an avid golfer, played every weekend and whenever he could during the week. Uh, he and my grandfather, after my grandmother died in 1959, wanted to do something in her memory. And they uh, chose a piece of property. It, I don't know how many acres, maybe about 15 acres or so, at the, on Old Big Cove Road. And they gave the land to the Big Cove community. It might have been through one of the churches, I'm not sure, but they, it, the deed reads to the Big Cove community for a burial ground in her memory. And they didn't want to name it after her. And they named it Green Valley Cemetery. And the land is, it's filled with graves today. And it was very important for the Big Cove community to have their own cemetery. There were family cemeteries scattered around for different folks that lived in the Big Cove, but this was the first cemetery. And what year was that? Hmm? What year? Uh, it was sometime, it was, I think it was around 1960, because she died in, 19, in the spring of 1959. Now, isn't it true at that time that there were very, very few people who actually lived in the Big Cove community? It's not like what it is today. No, correct. It was all farming, and we owned a, a large farm, the Big Cove farm, and other people owned farms, and so people were scattered. There was no town. There was no commercial. Everybody had to come to town. And, and so that was, as they had done the, the goldsmith Schiffman field in memory of Betty Goldsmith and Betty Schiffman, they wanted to remember my grandmother. And so that was an act of philanthropy that my grandfather and my father did together. My, my father married my stepmother, um, I'm trying to remember, in 1952. And I was 12 years old at the time. And we moved into the house on Gates Street, 206 Gates. And my grandparents then moved to the Russell Erskine uh, State. Well, they stayed in the Russell Erskine at the time. They were living in the Russell Erskine in the winter and the family home in the summer. And then they lived in the Russell Erskine from that time forward. And uh, then I grew up during my teen years on Gate Street. So the Russell Erskine, I want to go back for a second. At that time, it was a hotel, but also apartments? Yes. Where people lived there permanently. Right. There were other people beside my grandparents that lived there. Okay. Since we had, we really didn't have but a few apartments in town at that time. And of course, there were no condos or any other places. So as some elderly, a couple of elderly ladies that lived there, and if they didn't, weren't able to keep up a home and were alone, the hotel made a perfect spot. I think there were several. And there were two ladies, Hazel Robinson and Hazel and Nora Robinson, and they were both teachers. Hazel, Miss Hazel, taught dancing, and Nora taught um, home ed. Yeah, home ed at one of the schools. And they, 
would live here in, in the wintertime during the school year. And so the hotel was a perfect place for them to live. And then uh, they were from Texas and they would go to Texas in the summer. So that was the hotel at that time. That phased out after we started building apartments and there Sub were other subdivisions. subdivisions, there were other opportunities. My stepmother was very active in the Red Cross and in the hospital. The Gray Ladies had started and she was one of the first Gray Ladies, which was a volunteer organization for the hospital. And she, uh, she served on the, on the Red Cross, she was a volunteer, on the Blood Mobile, and then at the hospital for over 50 years. And at her 50th anniversary, I had a big party for her. And the hospital and the Red Cross participated and we had a video of covering her, her 50 years of volunteerism. And there were articles in the paper saying, uh, Miss Huntsville Hospital, they called her. Uh, she said she worked almost on, volunteered on almost every floor, uh, except the psychiatric ward, <laughs> which she couldn't have done. And um, what had, after, after, before she died, I wanted to do something for her in her memory and or in her honor and in Betty Goldsmith's memory since both had been so active in the hospital. In fact, Betty had been an inspiration, I think, when for my stepmother to do the volunteer work. And so I donated uh, the funds for the volunteer desk at the hospital to be named in in their, in their name, in honor of Jewel Goldsmith and in memory of Betty Goldsmith. Then we come up to me. <laughs> have, you, you have a picture now of the economic, the social, the social and the societal, or in civic, I guess societal is civic and social and so on. Then after my grandfather died, I was, um, I was 30, 72. And I realized then I had, I had gone to college at Tulane University, the Newcomb, Newcomb College, and married after I graduated. And I had three children. Uh, my youngest had just been born. And my grandfather died, and I then began to realize that one day, the, the family business would be my responsibility. And with a major in English, I certainly was not prepared. And I took, the first thing I did was I took accounting 101 at University College. And I'm not mathematical. That, that course almost killed me. You either make an A or you fail it. That's what accounting is. And then I followed that with real estate courses and getting my real estate license. The kids were in school, so I worked for a real estate company for a while. And then I liked appraisal, and I took appraisal courses and some course, some uh, member of the Appraisal Institute MAI courses, and worked for appraisers while the kids were in school. It was mostly, I felt like an intern, that I was learning I was preparing myself for what I might have to do one day in Huntsville. And the best way was to take courses and work there, which I did, up until um, my father's last years when I started coming here more. Um, while in New Orleans, in addition to raising the kids and working and taking courses. I also, when I was 40, began to get involved with the New Orleans Jewish community. Uh, not the temple. I was very in interested in the Jewish Federation. 
And my first exposure was being a member of uh, a young leadership group like we have here, the leaderships. But it was for just the, the Jewish community. And um, I, went to, I went to Israel. That was part of the program. And that was quite insightful for me. And I visited Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. And that, after that, then I was, I think I found, I had already read the paper, the family papers. But then I learned so much about the Holocaust. But by, I, I went on different boards and the most important board I went on was the Jewish Endowment Foundation, where I learned about philanthropic giving and how to use various funds to, um, to do perpetual, to create perpetual funds. And that, that was a wonderful education for me because it assisted my, I didn't know at the time, but it was, it enabled my own philanthropy, how to figure that out. So back to me, that, that's the background I came to Huntsville with in 95 when my father died. And then I came here for uh, long periods of time and I eventually moved here. And the, after f handling my father's estate, which took three years, that's what it takes for the IRS, uh, that I, I, was, I, I was able to take care of <coughs> with the help of the attorney, then I, I, I was left with the properties and with the farm properties. And I began to, uh, I did renovations of the, of the house that he and rented that. And I did a lot of maintenance that had been deferred during my father's latter years. And then I began to, I, I realized how Huntsville was growing. And I began my own estate planning because I, my children, as time went on, were all, I, they, they were going in different directions. Mm -hmm. As eventually my son moved to Israel and I had a daughter in Portland, Oregon, <clears throat> and a daughter who, was traveling a lot, but was here part of the time. And I knew it was important to move the assets that I'd inherited from my grandfather and, and, and my father's estate to my children. And so in different ways, um, I, I was able to get all of the farmland to them through gift, through uh, making exchanges. I had given land to them for a long time. So I was able to get it to them. And I then, uh, I made, I kept some, sold it, and I was able to develop the land for them. And, I, you know, I'm covering 25 years now in, in a synopsis, but I have developed it and I have sold most of it. I did the developing of the infrastructure and sold it to developers for housing. And so all of that area, the Big Cove area, which was the only farm we had at that time, uh, has developed. And I have been able to pass those assets onto the, onto the children and kept enough for myself to take care of me. Yeah. But that's, that's what I have done business-wise. That has taken the last 25 years <clears throat> and it's been a lot of a lot of work but at the same time I've been involved with uh, the family besides the family assets and that I've been involved with all of the artifacts that I inherited and all the archives I inherited now, more recently, uh, the, your family, you donated uh, land for the sanctuary, the Goldsmith Schiffman Sanctuary. The, mm -hmm. the, now, the, the site of the Goldsmith Schiffman School in mm -hmm. Hampton Cove, that mm -hmm. was also donated by mm -hmm. you? So, as, as I was disposing, not disposing, but passing on everything, 
I, I wanted to do something for the community, for the Huntsville community, in memory of all of my ancestors. I felt that was very important to carry on this tradition of philanthropy. And as I was, <clears throat> as I was selling the, the property, the farm properties for development, there was a perfect site for a, a park. And it was 300 acres on the Flint River that had been, it had been its bottom land and it had been cleared and cultivated even before our family acquired it. And the, the value of this bottom land was that the, the, the pastures or the cropland in that, in that area had been previously wetlands. And the Corps of Engineers has a program where you can create what we call a mitigation bank. And we can, and that is to return those, those prior converted fields to, back to wetlands. Mm -hmm. And this is, so when I gave it to the city, the value was to have this bank of, of, of prior converted fields. And it's taken all these years, it has just now gotten through the, I gave it in 2003, and it has just now been approved by the Corps of Engineers, and they have started the mitigation process of changing the landscape from what it is now back to wetlands. And trees are being planted, and uh, ponds are being put in, and it'll eventually be what it was back at the time of the Indians yeah. before the early pioneers. So the money from that, so I gave them a bank, and uh, the city has contributed money each year to it. And when, when the credits are sold out, because what you do is you, they can sell anyone who's developing property that is needs to it, wetlands. They're not allowed to destroy wetlands. They have to go to a wetland bank and buy a couple of acres to replace what they're destroying. So there's no there's no loss. There's no net loss of wetlands. So these these credits now are quite valuable, and the city will sell them or use them themselves, and and there will be a bank of money and hopefully it'll be at least a million dollars and it will be used for a visitor center. Okay. So, so it'll be a wonderful, one day it'll be a wonderful park.